This podcast is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Okay. Now here's a car with this woman sitting in the driver's seat. She's seat belted in. Her doors are locked. Her window is down. She's shot in the head. The ignition is on. The car is not running. The battery's dead. What do you see there? You said earlier that you agreed that oh, I she knew know. whoever it was. She trusted whoever it was. Okay. Well, she rolled the window down. What do you think happened then? It looks like a cop pulled her over. Sure does. People began to contact us with even more ominous information. Close friends and associates of the victim, Ms. Thompson, tell us that she had discussed with them how you were investigating her case. She discussed you with them by name. Mike Chappell, big guy, good looking guy. Good looking guy, big muscle bound guy. That's obviously you. They tell us that you arranged, were arranging to meet with her that night. They tell us that she had related to people how you had followed her. It's detailed information. You see, you see why we're here. You I, see the, you see see the gravity of this situation. Yeah. Do you see why that I'm sitting here talking to you like this? Because I'm fixing to hit you with the last piece of information. Pretty you were seen there. You've been identified there. At Gwento. At Gwento. Don't You've been identified with a flashlight standing by the driver's door of that car, looking inside the car, wearing your yellow rain gear. These people who saw you there proceeded on not thinking anything about it. You pulled out behind them. Me? Okay. You. Well, they're wrong. Absolutely mistaken. That is not me. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. None of us want to believe, wanted to believe, that you could have done that, that you could have done this. And we kept trying to leave that door open and say, it couldn't be the Mike Chapel we all know, respect, and love. It couldn't be Mike Chapel could have done this. And then, lo and behold, today you picked out a photo lineup. We need to know why. How? It says, I did not kill no one. That's I told you everything I know about the situation. Granted, you fucked up. I don't know what else to tell you. That's the truth. I don't know what to tell you now. I didn't do it. I wasn't there. I wasn't there. You are looking at the murder charge. I, I, I realize that. Armed robbery and murder. What can I say? Tell the truth. That is the truth, Lieutenant. Okay, now we're talking about it again. Now I gotta live it again. Now I gotta think about it again. Now I gotta remember things and then I go to rage. And then I come back down. And then I cry. And then I dream at night. And then I wake up and he's still not there beside me. Even 29 years later, I still look for my husband in my bed. And people would say, well, Aaron, you don't know you weren't there. And I said, let me tell you what I know. I married that man, and I lay down and bore two children with him. I know him. He would never do this. Not once did I ever question in my mind or in my private thoughts, in my heart, not once. Because I know he didn't. I know. Because he is innocent, And because this is our legacy, and because of the horrible way he's been treated, yeah, we're going to fight. I'll never stop fighting. I'm Sean Cunningham. From Imperative Entertainment, this is In the Land of Lies.
More than 30 years after Steve Mitchell closed Street Magic, in part because of the amount of drugs and crime creeping into the neighborhood, he's still a little timid speaking about this period of his life. It's clear he still has some level of fear for his safety. And as you hear the rest of his story, you'll understand why, and how this all relates to the larger story of Michael Chappell. Because as it turned out, Mitchell wasn't the only one with his eye on Gwinnett County police officers. He had contacted the FBI and the DEA about what he was witnessing while surveilling the area around Street Magic before it closed. And he says there were already two DEA agents embedded in the Gwinnett County police ranks for the same reason. In 1992, Mitchell was approached by Georgia Bureau of Investigations agent Steve Burroughs and asked for his assistance in busting a local drug ring. He would continue his surveillance and participate in prearranged drug buys alongside the GBI agent. I've seen several internal documents discussing Steve Mitchell's participation. Mitchell talked casually about some of his memories regarding these drug buys that he was a part of. Arrested, uh, yeah, the, and I don't, I can't remember this guy's name, but uh, when Peanut, Kenneth Cantrell delivered, uh, I forgot what it was. It's like a, a, a it's just a sample, like a gram of coke or meth. It wasn't the same person that delivered uh, the ounce of meth to who? Me the, who delivered that? Mitchell was talking there about a planned two kilo buy of cocaine from Captain Lewis Cantrell's son, Peanut. This particular time, he was working with a GBI agent, but after purchasing a sample of the product, the planned two kilo purchase never happened. For reasons Mitchell can't understand, the GBI seemed to abandon the entire mission after this. In a report Henry obtained and shared with me, it states that Peanut was questioned by investigators about this and other drug purchases. The report concludes with the words, so nothing else was done. But why would they just call it quits? We're talking about kilos of cocaine and meth here. Not to mention they were attempting to purchase it from a Gwinnett County police captain's son. Could Peanut have been tipped off? Mitchell became frustrated that the operation yielded no arrests and eventually quit working with all of the agencies, even repeatedly turning down payments he says he was offered for his continued service. I finally just discontinued because they just kept on and kept, uh, you know, showed up to buy the... But before Mitchell cut off all ties with the GBI, several events that took place put Steve Mitchell's life in danger. I was skeptical myself until I read the police reports. Mitchell began making copies of the audio and videotapes he amassed and hiding the originals in obscure places. He didn't know who, if anyone, could be trusted. And, and sometimes it was so important when it was just a micro cassette, but it was so important. I would stop at Best Buy or something and give the clerk $10 to let me use, you know, where they'd have the and, you know, I'd have the adapter and I could put it in there and put it on a regular cassette, you know, and copy it, you know, make the duplicates in Best Buy. You had all the tapes. Yeah. And you hid them, obviously because these guys had been messing with you and it made sense to yeah. hide, hide them. Well, the originals, I hid the originals, yeah. Mitchell contacted several journalists and reporters with the local media and tried to get them to go public with his story of police corruption, even providing at least one of them with copies of the surveillance tapes. Cat Yancey was one of those reporters. Miss Yancey was unwilling to be interviewed for this podcast, but she did verify by email that she was a staff writer for an Atlanta newspaper in the early 1990s, and that she met with Steve Mitchell on multiple occasions. She said he did provide cassettes to her of taped conversations he had recorded with a parabolic microphone, but unfortunately, she no longer has these tapes. Yancey tells me, however, she did not write a story about Mitchell's allegations because she did not, in her opinion, have enough evidence to support a story of that magnitude. She did not pursue the story further because she moved on to a different media company and job within a few months of meeting Mitchell. At the same time that Mitchell was working with Cat Yancey and the GBI in early 1993, 
he became aware that investigators were looking into Mike Chappell to see if he was connected to an attempted armored car robbery the previous year. But Mitchell was hesitant to believe that, as he'd gotten to know Chappell a bit through working out at Iron World. And while Chappell was friendly and just seemed to be a good cop and a good guy, there were a few other Gwinnett County police officers who hung around the gym that gave him a bad vibe. They had the kind of the pre-thug life vibe about them. You know, even though they're officers, they're, they're like bad to the bone, you know, routine. And, and I guess because I'm not, <laughs> I don't know, maybe I'm strange, but, you know, my evaluation of them was kind of like a bully. They picked their victims, you know. These other guys, they were not my kind of people. Wasn't the kind of people I only see in my community, but it wasn't my place to do anything about it. But Mike, he wasn't acting the same way as these three. Mitchell had come into possession of an internal file on Chapel outlining the investigation on him and decided to show him a printout. On the day Mitchell approached Chapel about this, he says the two men stepped into an alley behind Iron World. He wanted to step, you know, back into the alleyway, which I was like, uh oh. <laughs> well, we'll see how this plays out. I showed him a computer printout and then we got interrupted. But he looked at I think maybe one or two or three pages. And a person drove up on us the wrong way up a one-way street. Mitchell got spooked by the vehicle entering the alley the wrong way and the meeting was cut short. But by this point, he was clearly beginning to draw attention to himself, conducting surveillance, working with the GBI, claiming to have recordings of Gwinnett County officers dealing drugs, contacting the FBI, the DEA, local reporters, and now Mike Chappell tipping him off to an internal investigation on him. Mitchell was now apparently in the crosshairs of someone. Because shortly after this meeting with Chapel, the attacks on Steve Mitchell began. Word was going around at Gwinnett County Police Department that Steve Mitchell was crazy, a crackpot with absurd theories. And things would continue to escalate for Mitchell from this point on, as he was about to find out the hard way that sometimes, when you stick your nose where it doesn't belong, there are consequences. They shot the, they drove through the horseshoe driveway they drove through the driveway and shot my picture window out in a marked police, Gwinnett County police car. One drove by and shot a uh, shotgun blast through the picture window. And he didn't get out of the car because I could tell the shot went into the ceiling. Neighbors seen it and chased the car to the four way stop. Then now there's a red light out there. And they ran through like 90 mile an hour bonsai, you know, which that was. Man, that's desperation. Despite this blatant warning, Mitchell continued trying to get people to listen to the tapes he'd made and take him seriously. But in the pre-digital age, it was harder than it sounds to get people's attention. There was no YouTube, Facebook, or TikTok to post on and have it go viral. It seemed that the warning he received only pushed him harder to want to expose the corruption he says he was witnessing. It was escalating, so, you know, I would do my thing, you know, just like going around playing recordings. You know, I know I'm, I'm, I'm walking a path that I know where I'm going, and I know what to expect because the the culture is, they've got away with it so long that they think they're invincible. Shortly after the front window of his home was shot out, he was visited again. After the picture window was shot out, I started parking the stone in front of the house, behind the house. I pulled in, parked, and I was going in to get something. And on the opposite side, on the far side, I had steps, concrete steps going up. And then you'd go around and go to the front door. Just as I got nearly those steps, they, uh, two of them was hid behind a propane tank to the left. And then the, when I engaged them, the others came and all batons. Several men attacked Mitchell at his home and beat him he says, with police batons. Man, I had purple and red, dark red bruises all over me, and they hit me hard enough to, that you, you know, he hit me in the kidney, which you can't even scream it hurts so bad. But 
I made it up three steps, and that guy turned, I kicked him in the nose, and it had to broke his nose because it crunched. And I got in the house, but I was nearly unconscious. Clearly, Mitchell had pissed off all the wrong people, and he believed these attackers were Gwinnett County police officers as well, just like the ones who shot out his window. And it was about to get worse. Mitchell had become paranoid enough at this point to begin sleeping in a tent in the woods behind his home. He set up on a ridge with a high vantage point so that he could see if the attackers came back again. And on the night of January 17th, 1993, they did. I'm up high up on the ridge and I see it happening and everything, so I just shadow around. He spotted three figures milling around his home in the middle of the night. Then, you know, when they went inside, you know, it was like, what do you do? Okay, I come down to the edge of the yard and everything. I uh, heard the front door shut. I tried the front door, you know, the heat hadn't built up yet. I tried the front door and it was still locked. So somebody knew how to do a lock pick. That told me it was somebody's, not somebody's first dance, you know. I expect it to get worse than that. Mitchell entered the house and saw two men in black SWAT-style fatigues. As he entered a step further, he was attacked by a third and a fight ensued. Mitchell escaped the house and fled to the wooded area behind it. The men briefly pursued him. I went back into the woods, and once I'm in the woods, they're at a disadvantage. Barely when I got in the woods, when I say 70 yards, 80 yards, and they maybe got 30, I would laugh and say, come on, got something for you. And that ended that. And, and of course, I think they was on a time schedule. I don't think they wanted to hang around. He ran to a neighbor's house to have them call the police, then made his way carefully back to his house, which was now on fire. You could smell it burning, but nothing was, no windows and nothing was busted, and the but front door was creaking, and you could feel it shuddering. In the end, two rooms in his house were completely burnt before the fire department arrived and extinguished the flames. They just pulled everything out and just throwed it in one pile here and then another room, throwed everything in a pile. And, you know, like pulling drawers out, turn them upside down, dump whatever, just throw it in a pile, you know. And uh, I know what they was looking for was, you know, floppy disks and VHS tapes and micro cassette recordings and stuff like that. The three assailants were all wearing SWAT-style military gear with bulletproof vests. The neighbor of Mitchell's also witnessed the three men in black tactical gear and masks running from the burning house. Arson was determined as the cause of the fire, and soon after, Mitchell received money from the insurance claim. But there was one thought that Mitchell couldn't shake. One of the men was significantly taller than the others that night. The news of Chapel possibly being tied to the armored car robbery lingered. Mitchell started to wonder if Chapel was a dirty cop himself. What I wanted to know was if he wasn't. You know, there's a difference. It's a big, big difference if he wasn't. He devised a plan to find out. He would put Chapel to a test of his own design. On April 8, 1993, just two months after the murder of nightclub owner Henry Jeffcoat and one week before the murder of Emma Jean Thompson, Steve Mitchell pulled up to Iron World Gym grabbed an old McDonald's bag off his car's floorboard, and neatly tucked $40,000 in cash into it, money from the insurance payout from his firebombed house. I dressed well, as non concealable of a weapon as possible. Went in, had an old McDonald's bag that had probably been in the back floorboards for months. You know, put it in there, and walked in, and he's in his office, and says, look at this, and <laughs> just poured it out on his desk. What was his reaction when you dumped the money out? He didn't spaz out or nothing. The eye reaction was like, crap, you know. <laughs> you know, it's like, here comes this redneck. You gotta figure back then, that was a pretty good chunk of change. 
Mitchell baited Chapel with the idea that he had made the money in an easy and not necessarily legal way and insinuated that there was more out there for the taking, if he was interested. He waited to see if Chapel would bite, but he didn't. Instead, Chapel excused himself from his office, saying he had to go check on one of his trainers. What Mitchell didn't know is that officers at Gwinnett County Police Department had been talking to Chapel and warning him of Mitchell, that he should be on the lookout at Iron World because Mitchell himself was suspected of being a domestic terrorist. Chapel called agent Monica Hack to report that Mitchell was in his gym, but Mitchell, of course, didn't hang around long. He told no one of him offering Chapel the $40,000, though shortly after, received a stern warning from one of the agents he had previously worked with on drug buys. He said they won't tolerate a vigilante. And I'm like, well, Mike told somebody. Mike did tell someone. He told internal affairs immediately. So to Steve Mitchell, that was enough proof that Michael Chapel wasn't a dirty cop. He didn't take the money. If Mike was as desperate for money as they said, why didn't he? He'd already asked me if I'd be interested in teaching martial arts at his gym. So I come in with $40,000. If he really needed money, why didn't he try for it? I mean, you know, like business-wise. So if Mike was so hard up and desperate for money, the bad guy with 40 grand, who was, who was a known bad guy in his mind, or an innocent grandmother for seven grand. Why would Mike kill some innocent grandmother one week later for six or seven thousand dollars? Which one's he going to take? By now, you can probably tell that Henry is undeniably passionate about Chapel's case and outraged that, in his opinion, an innocent man has spent the last 29 years in prison. But Henry Ball didn't start out being an advocate for Michael Chapel. So how is it that he came to be such a champion for Chapel's fight for freedom? Why is this so important to him? Still to this day, I have a little bit of a ringing in my ear from when I was, I think, six years old. My dad asked me if I wanted to go to the hospital because of a, a massive cut I had on my knee from dishes that he broke in the house or if I wanted to stay there with him and watch TV. And of course, I said I wanted to go with my mother to the hospital. And he balled his fist up like a barroom brawler and punched me in the side of the head and knocked me out and busted my eardrum. And my eardrum was permanently busted. So by the time I was seven years old, you know, that was kind of the life I knew. Henry was raised in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and suffered through a childhood that was marred by physical abuse from his father. You know, I, I look at the juxtaposition between my seven-year-old and who I was when I was seven years old. You know, my seven-year-old is a bright, funny, wonderful little boy. And, and he, doesn't, he doesn't know a lot about like the negative things that this world has to offer, unfortunately. By the time I was seven, you know, I, I had been through so much physical abuse at the hands of my you know, alcoholic father, my abusive alcoholic father. My mother, who is a wonderful woman and worked three jobs to raise six kids, pretty much on her own because, you know, my father really was only a, an obstacle to all of us because his addictions really kind of drove his life for his, his whole adult life from seven to 17, I had basically zero parental guidance. The lower middle-class neighborhood Henry lived in was full of kids with experiences and upbringings similar to his. They were the latchkey kids who, in part, raised themselves and to some degree, raised each other on the streets. It's a story that, unfortunately, we've all heard before. Children left largely to their own devices, of course, tend to get into trouble more. Trouble that often escalates as they get older, if gone unchecked. Such is the case with Henry. At 17 years old, 
His rebellious actions resulted in him spending two years in the Louisiana Training Institute for Boys, a prison for juveniles. I went in on the day of my 17th birthday and I came out on the day of my 19th birthday. Again, it was juvenile, but it was, but it was correctional. It was a correctional facility. But I was a kid and I was scared and I was going to prison and you hear all these stories about what they do to people in prison. There was a, you know, big guard station in the middle of it and they, you know, buzz pop the doors open and you, you come out and they put, put you in shackles and, you know, shackle you to another uh, inmate to go to the dining hall. We would have like two hours of recreation a day where we would go out in the back in the yard that was all kind of maximum security like um, razor wire fences and, you know, guard tower and all that kind of stuff. You know, you weren't allowed to have any, you know, you had a toothbrush, toothpaste, roll of toilet paper, and, you know, they allowed you to have a, a couple of books. I did a lot of reading. Pretty much everything I've learned in my life has been kind of self-taught, and it started there. As someone who's never been locked up, I try to put myself in his shoes and really understand what that would feel like, not only for Mike Chapel, but even for Henry at the juvenile level. I'd have to say there's a hopelessness to being confined like that. And it's very degrading to not really be able to have anything, to have to ask for permission for everything or to do anything, and to only be kind of let out of that cage, you know, to eat and for a little bit of recreation. It's, um, it's difficult. That's very hard on your soul. You know, that, that kind of man is not meant to be confined. Man is not meant to be in a cage. That makes me feel very empathetic towards someone who is there in that situation. A, not knowing when they're going to get out. And B, knowing that they didn't do what they were accused of doing. I can't, I can't imagine that. I was able to use my short time, my brief time to change my life and to think through how to be a better person. I'm kind of thankful for that, but to have been in that situation for nearly three decades and not knowing when you're going to get out and knowing that you did not do the crime that you're there for, I couldn't couldn't process that. Henry's experience has given him a unique perspective on Chapel's incarceration. Maybe that's why he's chosen to fight so emphatically for his release and exoneration. But he says there is one colossal difference. I know that Michael Chapel is innocent. If I was sitting in prison for 28 years for a crime I did not commit, I damn sure hope somebody would fight for me. Henry claims Chapel is innocent with such confidence. But why? How can he be so sure? To truly find out, we need to go back to the night Imogene Thompson made the 911 call. We know that Chapel responded to a burglary call at Emma Jean Thompson's home on April 3rd, 1993, and that he suspected her son, Michael, was the one who stole the $7,000. We also know Chapel responded to the Thompson home a second time on April 4th, when Emma Jean called in to Gwinnett County Police and specifically requested Chapel's assistance. She asked Chapel to run the boo on her son and try to scare him into confessing and returning the money, as she had, by this point, also suspected her son. Chapel visited Michael Thompson at his place of work, a Subway restaurant, on April 7th, but was unsuccessful in getting a confession. Chapel maintains that he had no further contact with Imogene 
or Michael Thompson again. On the night of April 15th, Imogene left her home at the usual time of 9.50 p.m., headed for work. Neighbor and friend of her son's, Amy Parker, stated that she had just used Thompson's phone at approximately 9.45 p.m., something she did frequently because she didn't have a phone of her own, leaving just as Imogene did. Another neighbor in the small trailer park witnessed Amy Parker near Imogene's car at this time. Phone records did not show any calls made from the Thompson home, though, around this time. So what was Amy Parker really doing there? This window of time is incredibly important because the medical examiner would later narrow down Thompson's time of death to somewhere between 9.30 and 10 p.m. That time is crucial because Michael Chappell was said to have arranged a meeting with Imogene that same night to compare serial numbers on money he had found to the remaining $7,000 she had. Chappell denies this ever took place. If he had arranged a meeting time with her, why would he be there 45 minutes to an hour before the meeting time? Why would he do it in such an visible place where there's going to be all kinds of traffic passing by. He knows Gwinnett County just as well as anybody. And if he needed her to meet him in a secluded place, he could have arranged to have her meet somewhere else. Anybody who has any kind of sense who's planning a murder like this isn't going to do it in the most likely place for him to be seen. And then sit there 45 minutes ahead of time waving at people You know, so they say, oh, yeah, I saw the guy. Remember, witnesses described seeing a police car at the scene as early as 8.45 p.m., one hour before the murder, which was eventually concluded to occur at 9.45 p.m. And if Imogene had planned a meeting with Chapel before work, would she still have left home at her usual time of 9.50 p.m., as witnesses described? Would she not have left a bit earlier? They're basically saying it happened at 9.45, but at 9.45, Imogene Thompson was still at her house. We got two witnesses that said she didn't leave her house till 9.50. So she couldn't have been killed unless she was killed at her house. She couldn't have been killed at 9.45 at the Glencoe Muffler shop because she wasn't there. Henry tells me more about the night of Imogene's murder. So one of the earlier eyewitnesses was uh, Dr. Busey, who testified that he saw the Gwinnett County police car essentially by itself facing out towards Peachtree Industrial is back off the road a little bit closer to the muffler shop, which is where several other witnesses saw the car by itself. Seemed like a, you know, cop basically watching traffic. Dr. Busey would actually pick two pictures out of the lineup saying that, you know, these are possibly the the person, one of them being Chapel. At trial, Dr. Busey realized and recognized that he had actually met Officer Chapel just a few weeks prior when he was called to the scene of an accident where a horse had been hit or something and, and the horse had to be put down. He knew Mike from that occurrence and acknowledged that, hey, I might have recognized Mike from that. The other thing is, not to impeach his testimony, but it was 8.45 at night on a very dark, dreary, rainy night, at least 150 feet away from the roadway with no overhead lights. It's hard to understand how he could have picked anybody out of that At approximately 9.55 p.m., a witness named David Magaha described seeing a lone brown sedan parked at the Gwinco muffler shop on Peachtree Industrial Boulevard as he drove by. That car was later determined to be Emma Jean Thompson's. No other vehicles were present at that time. He passed at 9.55, saw Emma Jean Thompson's car, who had apparently just pulled up. Right at 10 o'clock, a gentleman by the name of Ron Flashner reported to GCPD that he saw a old sedan backed up to the victim's car. So, you know, trunk to trunk, 
and it was facing out towards Peachtree Industrial, the old sedan. And, um, and the distinctive feature that he s- described of this vehicle was that it was emanating a bunch of engine smoke. So much engine smoke that he described driving through a cloud of smoke across Peachtree Industrial. But through that cloud of smoke, he said he saw three or four individuals around the victim's car. And this was right at 10 o'clock, which is consistent with her having arrived at 9.55. The next eyewitness account would prove to be critical to the case. And then it was probably somewhere between five to 10 minutes after that, that the two witnesses who witnessed the police officer out, out of the vehicle past the muffler shop and they saw not the old sedan backed up to the vehicle but they saw a police car behind the vehicle as if a a stop had been made and they saw what they described as a an approximate six foot cop wearing a rain slicker and a rain hat with a flashlight in his hand walking up to the victim's car 12 eyewitnesses were interviewed and described seeing a police car parked at Gwynco between 8.30 and 10 p.m., some even specifically describing the older, boxy-style police cruiser with a wide yellow stripe down the side. It was a vehicle that Gwinnett County Police used as a backup. That, that's not the only thing that was seen, right. but but that is one of the things. And, that, and obviously that's something that would have given the police you know, a lot of concern, particularly when they couldn't find and they checked all of the other agencies that would have been operating to see if anyone had any information on anybody either running traffic patrol or having pulled somebody over. They basically came up empty. So there was no verifiable, bona fide reason for a police officer to have been at the scene. Carl Cowder and Paul Amote were two civilians returning from a function for the auto industry in which they both worked when they passed by Gwynco shortly after 10 p.m. 45 miles an hour, they passed the muffler shop. Just a couple hundred feet up the road, the road expands from two lane to four lane. And they say at that point, this officer had gotten back into his vehicle and caught up to them drove alongside them at at about the same speed for 30 to 45 seconds to where a positive identification was made. And then with no intervening stops, the cop turns right just past Highway 20, which is seven tenths of a mile from the Gwynco muffler shop. So in seven tenths of a mile, all of this has occurred. Cowder was the passenger in the vehicle. He was able to get a good look at the officer who drove alongside of him for up to 45 seconds. He later identified the man as Michael Chappell from a photo lineup. Henry takes issue with this account, though. What that entails is, is that the the officer walked up to Imogene Thompson's car, fired two shots, apparently went around to the passenger side, got the bloody purse out and dropped blood inside the the passenger door jam, closed the door, came back around, locked the doors, slashed the tire, went back to the vehicle, got some blood on their own vehicle, backed the car out onto Peachtree Industrial, and would have had to travel at about 245 miles an hour to catch up to them at that point. Thompson's car doors were all locked, yet there were traces of her blood found on the ground on both sides of the car as well as inside the passenger door jam. The front left tire was slashed two times, Imogene had been robbed, and her purse was not found at the scene. So everything Henry described needed to happen in an extremely short time frame for this to work. Remember, the two witnesses, Cowder and Emote, said they initially saw the officer walking up to the car with his flashlight shining in the victim's window as they drove by. Traveling at 45 miles an hour in the rain, which is which would have been impossible. It just r- regardless of any anything else that Mr. Cowder has said about his testimony, what he testified to and what Paul Emote testified to is physically impossible. 
Neither Cowder nor Emote heard gunshots, which several people in nearby areas did hear at approximately 10 p.m. Those shots, whenever they occurred, were heard by multiple people up to a mile away, but the people that were 200 feet away didn't hear the shots. But even if you take the shots out of it, even if you take the slash tire out of it, even if you take the purse out of it, even if the guy just a second that Cowder and Emote passed the muffler shop, if in that second he turned around, ran back to his vehicle, jumped into his vehicle, backed out on the Peachtree Industrial, put the car in drive, and went 45 miles an hour, he would have never caught them. He wouldn't have come close to catching them. The timeline doesn't seem physically possible. They both described this individual as around six foot. In fact, that they asked one of them, well, you know, how could you tell? He said, well, he was about my size. Well, how, how tall are you? Well, I'm 5'11". The description of the officer they witnessed that night sounds nothing like Michael Chappell, whose mountainous physique would surely not have been confused with someone who is average sized. Wearing a bright yellow size 3X raincoat and hat, he would have appeared even larger unmistakably so. But there is one thing that I left out about that night. It's concerning the car with a large amount of smoke emanating from it that eyewitness Ron Flashner saw parked trunk to trunk with Emma Jean's around that same time, 10 p.m. A neighbor of Emma Jean Thompson's or right in the vicinity who happened to be a Gwinnett County firefighter, he described that car because he would hear that car coming into the neighborhood every day, and he described it as a big, smoking, clacking old Buick. It was real loud, and you could hear him coming. Uh, the car was so loud, like it was running with uh, no exhaust on it. It smoked. The big, smoking sedan is uniquely matching the victim's son, Michael Thompson's 78 Buick, that had a busted head gasket. I have so many questions about what happened that night. Questions for Michael Thompson, for Amy Parker, and even more questions for Steve Mitchell and Henry Ball. But the man I really need to speak with is the man who's been convicted of murder and been behind bars for 29 years. I needed to hear his side of the story and find out if he is telling the truth. I needed to speak with Michael Chappell. So, just arrived at Long Unit State Prison here in Ludowisi, Georgia. I'm about to meet Michael Chappell face to face for the first time. So, here we go. I get it. I get it. I was the poster boy for their template of what they were looking for. I mean, they were looking for a great big, muscle-headed, gym rats, drug interdiction types. And I was at the head of the list. In the Land of Lies is a production of Imperative Entertainment. It was written and reported by me, Sean Kipe, and I wrote and performed the original music score. Story editor is Jason Hoke, and executive producers are Jason Hoke and Gino Falsetto. Cover art and design by Gina Sullivan. Sound engineering by Shane Freeman. Creative producer is Henry Ball, and you can find Henry's book, Michael Chapel, at storiedpress.store. For updates about this and all of my podcasts, follow me on social media at Sean Kipe. If you like the show, tell your friends and leave a review. And as always, thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.